Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome to Running Denver TV, and I'm your host, Lonnie Summers. We're so excited to have you back. Hope you made some great resolutions for the 2016 year and that you had a happy holidays, but we're so excited to start off 2016 at an indoor location. The thing is, will you be able to guess where we're at? We've got tennis courts, swimming pools, training rooms, all kinds of fun things, a track to run on. You can lift weights, so stick around. We'll see if you know where we're at. Hey, did you guess where we're at? We're here at Greenwood Athletic Club. This beautiful facility is located off of I-25 and Orchard here in the Denver Tech Center. This facility, believe it or not, is 153,000 square feet, including 12 tennis courts that are right behind me and Denver's only six lane heated outdoor lap pool. How cool is that? We're gonna be talking to one of Greenwood's trainers a little later in the show about workouts for running that they can do inside to stay in shape during those cooler days and also when it's darker out. Of course, we're enjoying a beautiful day right now, but it's New Year's. We want to keep everybody motivated, keep up with those resolutions. So we'll be talking to them about some things that you can do inside, especially, you know, treadmill can be kind of boring running on every once in a while. So we're going to have some great ideas to keep you inside working out in shape during those colder days. But first, we have an interview with someone who is truly inspiring. Her name is Emily Harvey, and she'll be here with us. So make sure you stick around. Hi, welcome to Running Denver show, and I'm here with a really good friend of mine, Emily Harvey, and we're so excited, Emily, to have you on the show, so thank you for being here on the show. Thank you for having me. And what I want to talk a little bit about, Emily's going to talk a little bit about her story, but it's been really fun talking and getting to know a little bit more about her and her overcoming her own disability, and as she likes to say, I, I think she's an inspiration, but she's going to talk to us a little bit about what the word inspiration truly means to her, but first, tell us a little bit about your story. Sure. So I was born with fibular hemimelia, which is a big word that basically just means I didn't have a fibula bone in my left leg. And I also had a pretty big leg length discrepancy. Um, so when I was born, my legs were about two centimeters different, my left leg two centimeters shorter. And now it's about five or six inches, I think. So if I had a foot, it would be five or six inches higher than my right side. So when I was two, my parents elected to have my foot amputated. Um, and got multiple opinions, but decided that was the best course of action. And I don't really remember having a foot, so it's always been my normal and how I grew up. So that's just kind of always been who I am. And you really never let that stop you from doing the things that you want to do. You told us that you like to do high horseback riding. Yeah, so when I was younger, I played t-ball and soccer and the normal kids sports. They made me wear shin guards on both legs, which I thought was kind of silly, but apparently it was to protect the other kids in case they kicked me. Um, and then when I was nine, I started riding horses and I rode competitively uh, through college, through two years of college. And then it was about in 2013, you were telling me that you got the bug and really wanted to start running. Yeah, so I moved to Denver in 2013, in January. And I had a friend living here and she said, hey, Emily, let's walk the run into the green. And so I did. And while I was walking the 7K, I looked around and I said, all these people are running. I want to be running. And so I talked to my husband who happens to make artificial limbs. And we were able to get my running leg made. And I started running probably soon after that race. And I joined Achilles International, which is a running club for people with disabilities. And I've been running with them every week, pretty much. I rarely miss it. And um, they've been a great source of motivation for me to continue with my running. Um, so that's kind of when I started. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the things that you're involved in, too. But you were talking about in 2013, you got into running. And then I'm actually holding your, your running leg here. And this part's kind of known as a cheetah. Yep. And uh, you just informed me that um, this is actually about $10,000. So I'm handling this very carefully, even though <laughs> I know you abused it and show us how much springy it is. Um, but interestingly enough, because I'm sure there's a lot of uh, others with disabilities, and this is actually really hard to come by. It's like you can just go pick this up at your local store and be able to start running with it. I know it's custom to you, but you were talking a little bit about how difficult it is to actually get this and how difficult it is to actually even get paid for by insurance companies. Sure, yeah. So even regular walking legs can be difficult to get paid for by insurance. There's some insurance companies that have a one leg per life policy. 
And then moving into sport specific equipment is even harder because insurance really will only pay for things that are medically necessary. Sometimes you can get insurance to pay for something like a running leg if you can show that it's medically necessary. However, there are also organizations like the Challenged Athletes Foundation, which will provide grants for people to get sports equipment um, if they have disabilities. So, you know, access to prosthetics is hard and access to sports specific prosthetics is even harder, even though it, I believe, leads to a better quality of life. I think that the word inspiration gets um, used a lot today, specifically with people with disabilities that are visual, or not visual, but things that you can see. Uh, so I think that everyone has challenges. Every single person has challenges that they're facing in life. And just because you can see my challenge, because it's so obvious, I don't think that makes me any more or less an inspiration than other people. And so I feel like I maybe don't deserve that word um, because I think that people tell me I'm an inspiration, but I think that they're inspiring me too um, because they might have a challenge that we don't see that they're overcoming. Um, and I also think that rather than being a source of inspiration, which I see as like, you feel warm and fuzzy by looking at me and what I can do. And um, I would rather be seen as a source of motivation for people. So if someone sees me and they say, oh, she's such an inspiration and then do nothing, I don't feel like that's really positive. Um, I feel like if someone says, oh, she's such an inspiration and then they go out and start running or swimming or biking or hiking, whatever it is, drawing, if, if that's how they act on that inspiration and it turns into motivation to actually take action, um, then that's more of, of what I see as a positive and how I can be a positive force in the community. Well, Emily, thank you so much, very much for being involved in everything you do. And if you'd like to check out more on Emily's interview, make sure to go to runningdenver.com. Hey everybody, I'm here with my new friend Tristan Mitchell, who's one of the trainers here at Greenwood Athletic Club. Tristan, thank you so much for being with us Absolutely. on the show today. You know, you and I were talking just uh, real briefly and you know, we both love to run and it's great if we can actually get outdoors and run and we're lucky in Colorado that we get a lot of beautiful weather and it gives us a lot of opportunities to do that as opposed mm -hmm. to other areas of the country. But let's face it, days are shorter and we do get cold weather every now and then and uh, it may not be as fun. So one of the things that's almost a hard thing for us as runners to accept is having to go inside and work out, yep. whether it's on the track or treadmill. And I know that you've got some tips and some ideas to help keep our viewers motivated and some cool workouts that they can do to get them through those times when they can't make it outside. Yep, absolutely. I think if you are forced to run inside, I think, um, or if it's just smarter to run inside, like you said, whether it's icy out or dark or whatever the reasons may be, if you're inside, I think giving yourself variety is probably one of the biggest keys to running indoors, in my opinion. Um, I think when you're getting on the treadmill, giving yourself some sort of interval workout to do, whether it's timed intervals or distance, uh, distant intervals, um, you know, I think that's going to be a big way of kind of getting through an hour of just grinding away in a single spot. Uh, I also am a huge proponent of in, uh, including some incline work on treadmills as well. I think a lot of people get a little uncomfortable with speed on a treadmill, especially as you're running faster and harder, you feel a little uncomfortable on that belt. Uh, a lot of the same adaptations you're looking for from a speed standpoint can be found with just bringing that incline up, keeping the speed a little more comfortable, but say, hey, I'm gonna crank the incline up to six, 8%, um, you know, and you can still kind of elicit a lot of the same physiological adaptations you're looking for out of kind of a more traditional speed workout. Uh, if that's what you're going for from an interval standpoint. I would say when it comes to a track at least, I think um, especially a track like this, it's a lot of laps around this guy to equal one mile. So if you're trying to get in 10 miles, I personally would recommend getting on a treadmill versus running around this thing 100 and whatever, 60 times. And you know, you're making what, 600 and quick math over 600 turns here, you know, in 10 miles. That would be a long, lot of turns, lot, you know, that's hard on the body. You so get somebody with a little clicker to make sure they Yeah, right, play. and who knows if you're keeping track of that, too. Right. That's the other thing, too, try to keep track of those numbers. So I think, I think a treadmill, if you're going for distance, I would say a treadmill. If you're going for, you know, two or three miles, 
you know, I, I, you know, I think obviously there's always, you know, how people feel about treadmills is mixed. I think as runners, some people really enjoy them, others don't. I think my experience with triathletes, they have no problem with treadmills, but I think they're very used to, you know, being in a pool indoors. They're used to being on spin bikes, stuff like that. Um, I think runner specific, a lot of people want a track. So if you want a track, use a track, but you know, I would be cautious about how many laps, how many turns you're putting on your body, those sharp 90 degree turns, how many you're putting on, uh, you know, that's gonna, you're, you're gonna, you're, that's gonna take a little bit of a toll on the body over time for sure, so. What would be, just uh, for our viewers and stuff like that, take us through, like I got a half an hour run to do, what would be like a good sample type of program you might recommend to somebody on when they should, what type of warm-up they should do, mm -hmm. when should they incline, and, and obviously yep. create some other variety. Yeah, um, I think I'm a big proponent of uh, variety in general, for sure. I think, you know, I think obviously when it comes to more broad recommendations, it depends obviously on the athlete, where they are in their training, um, you know, what they're looking like when it comes to their cycle and overall volume, things like that. Um, you know, the, if, you're, if you're just in the beginning of your marathon cycle, then, you know, or if you're new to running, then I would obviously say, you know, just get on and put some time on your feet kind of thing. Don't overdo it. If you're somebody who has got some experience, you've run some halves, run some fulls maybe, um, or, you know, maybe you're just a 10K guy who runs for performance, whatever, whatever that may be. If you're looking around for more kind of performance um, uh, workouts themselves, I think, especially for a treadmill, I'm a big fan of, of shorter duration, higher intensity, kind of more bang for your buck. There's a lot of good research around right now, just the idea of, you know, longer isn't always better for us. And in that ideal, uh, in, in that idea of a 30 minute workout, especially, maybe say, hey, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do eight 30 second rounds of all out at a 6% incline, and then I'm gonna walk for two minutes in between. Or, and I know walking can be very dreaded for a lot of us, but, um, or you're gonna run very easy for two minutes to let yourself, let that system reset. Um, the idea or the concept around that is more making sure that each interval is, is you're not getting in, you're not getting kind of pulled into that more fatigued gray zone training, which I think a lot of runners find themselves in. Um, you know, it, unless you are very, very conditioned and have a lot of good running experience and a lot of volume under you, a lot of the times when you're doing interval work and you don't give yourself a proper recovery, each successive interval is going to come down in intensity a little bit and you're losing some of that adaptation at that point. You know, and then obviously too, you could just look at a more traditional track workout and say, hey, you know, again, if you've got kind of the, if you've got the experience, say, hey, I'm gonna jump on, I'm gonna do 10 minute warm up. And then I'm gonna do eight, you know, 400s, quarter miles as fast as I can with a 400 down in between on each one. To me, that would be something I would prescribe to a little bit more of a conditioned runner than, uh, than you know, somebody who's just getting into it. So I think it it's definitely uh, varies on the athlete. Well, that sounds like a really good program. And I think that also helps kind of dispel a myth too. I think a lot of us runners that we fall into, because yeah. we do so much training that's like, during the winter months, maybe I'm not, uh, going for a marathon mm -hmm. in the uh, spring time frame, and I'm not really training for anything, but I have it misconceived in my head that I got to get out there and do an hour. Yes. And you can come in and, and do a 20 minute, 30 minute type of hit type interval workout. Completely. And be completely, uh, actually improve your fitness, completely. not lose anything. Completely. And still have uh, some time. And feel better. And feel, you know, I think that's one thing too is I think, I think a lot of runners, you know, don't realize how much of a toll just the, 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 the daily, weekly, monthly, yearly grind ends up taking on our bodies over time. And, you know, I'm speaking from somebody who's been running seriously for the last decade, you know, anywhere between, you know, a low volume week for me is 50 a week, a high volume week when I'm in full marathon training is gonna be somewhere around 80, 90. And it's hard for me mentally to say, I shouldn't run 50 miles this week. You know, like we all have that OCD, right? I mean, and, and wh whatever that number is, it doesn't have to be 50, that number could be 20. But ex you're exactly right, I think, saying sometimes it's good to just focus on quality over quantity, I think is, is, is something that is greatly missed upon many runners. And, and, and I, think it's, I think it is, I think a lot of that is kind of built around our, our or I gotta get that hour, or I gotta get six miles, or I got, you know, and it is, it, it, becomes, it becomes almost an obsessive compulsive thing versus what's actually gonna benefit me as a runner and what's actually gonna make me feel good tomorrow, you know, so.
Wonderful. Yep. Well, Tristan, thank you very much Absolutely. for giving us that information. That's very helpful. And just remember, you know, you can still stay in shape through those winter months. Uh, you don't have to ne neglect your workouts at all. You can still get inside and do some things. On Definitely. Those darker days and colder days as well. Thank you very yep. much, Tristan Mitchell. Absolutely. With Pleasure. Athletic, one of the trainers here, and we'll be right back. It's time for Review Preview. First up in review, the Polar Prowl 5K, 10K, and Half Marathon was Saturday, January 9th at Bear Creek Lake Park. In the 5K, Juan de Jesus finished in first place for the men with a time of 21.51, and Katie Cooley won the women's race with a time of 23.51. In the 10K, Aitan Halper Stromberg finished first for the men with a time of 37.15, and Emma Jacobson came in first for the women with a time of 48.36. In the half marathon, the winners were Max Bennett for the men with a time of 1 hour 26 minutes, and Shannon Meredith for the women with a time of 1 hour 33 minutes. In preview, we have several fun races coming up in the rest of January. Frosty's Frozen 5 and 10 miler is Saturday, January 16th at Hudson Gardens in Littleton. The course travels the paved Platte River Trail and all finishers get a medal. This race benefits the Fetal Health Foundation. Go to coloradorunnerevents.com slash frosty to register. The next race is the Polar Bear 5K at Wash Park on Sunday, January 17th. This is the second race in the Run Denver series, and new this year is the option to take the Polar Bear Challenge and get an ice bath to support the charity partners, Girls on the Run, and the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Head to RunDenverSeries.com to register. That's it for today's episode on Running Denver TV. Thank you to Greenwood Athletic Club for having us as a guest today, as well as our guest Emily Harvey and Tristan Mitchell. For more episodes of Running Denver TV and for segments including interviews, gear, and training, please visit us at our website, runningdenver.com. I'm Lonnie Summers, and we'll see you next time.